Energy is really taking over in a lot of new ways. We've seen everything from solar expansion, and now we're going into a topic called geothermal, and uh, it's gonna be an interesting discussion today. My name is Paul Barron, this is Tech Path. We're gonna jump right into it with the CEO of Dandelion Energy, Kathy Hanoon. Great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, Kathy, let's jump into a little bit about Dandelion. First of all, before we get started on just about Dandelion, I want to, you know, because I was looking through your bio a little bit about how you started the the concept here the, and got going with the startup. Uh, you were over at uh, Project X uh, with Google. Tell me a little bit about how that worked. What were you doing over there, and how did uh, Dandelion start? Absolutely. So X is Alphabet's moonshot factory, um, the part of the company that's responsible for futuristic ideas that could make a big difference to society. So the flagship right product there is the self-driving car. And yep. I was what was called a rapid evaluator. So my job was to find new possible moonshots. So what, what should we be doing that we're not doing today? What opportunities mm -hmm. might exist that Alphabet can invest in? Um, so then, with, go, go, ahead. go ahead. I was just going to ask you, with that job of evaluating all these different concepts and uh, theories and maybe, you know, early on science, how many of those did you look at in your career? I don't even, I couldn't even tell you. Probably so there's thousands. that much kind of innovation <laughs> coming in. Great. I mean, the reason that the title was rapid evaluator is because, yeah, you really end up going through so many ideas and, you know, I think for most ideas, it's fair to say it's fairly fast to figure out why it's not going to be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. So you just got to go through a lot. As the old adage says, you got to put in enough information out there to be able to get that one granule of uh, potential opportunity exactly. that is real. Exactly. I completely understand that. Let's get into a little bit about your mission with Dandelion. Uh, tell me about where you guys are trying to do and, and where you're going with geothermal. So yeah, one of the ideas that ended up growing and becoming a whole business now was this idea that you know we burn a lot of fossil fuels in buildings to heat them. It's actually like we don't think about it because these systems are in our basement, they're in our attic, but for most people, the single biggest source of carbon emissions that they generate outside of driving a car is heating their home. And right. this is um, unfortunate for many reasons, but one of which is for decades, there's been this technology called geothermal heating and cooling that is at, it's emissions free, extremely efficient, extremely comfortable heating, and it's an all-in-one heating, cooling, and hot water generating system but it's been way too expensive in the past. So only yeah. the very wealthy have been able to afford it. Uh, and so Dandelion is a startup that grew out of that work at X, really looking at how can we apply modern technology and a new business model to dramatically lower the cost of geothermal heating and cooling so that it's actually less expensive than heating your home with common types of heating fuels like propane, fuel oil, a lot of these very expensive fuels that are used throughout the country. And then eventually, our mission is: Can we make this technology actually the least, um, the least expensive way to heat or cool out of any way? So just like for any house, they're better off with a heat pump. Right. Yeah. Um, what, okay. So you you guys seem to be targeting around ten thousand uh, homes a year. Um, what are some of the roadblocks that you're running into when you when you take on that big a bite of being able to roll something like this out? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many um, problems that we've had to overcome to scale up the business. Um, everything from, you know, we actually have to install these ground loops under a customer's yard to harvest that geothermal heat. So just finding, you know, training enough drillers and hiring them from different industries, training them for geothermal and then applying them to this one. We had to manufacture our own heat pump. Um, we've had to just completely change the way uh, geothermal is designed and sold to make it much more scalable and a much customer, more customer friendly experience. So there, you know, throughout the whole process, there's been a lot of change that has needed to happen. Yeah. What is some of the technology you have to use to actually install something like this? I mean, because this seems to be a very specialized art of being able to really come into a plot of land or a, how, a home 
and actually do something that's, you know, subterranean, mm -hmm. what do you guys have to do? I mean, are you using like, you know, x-ray, LIDAR? What's, what's some of the tech <laughs> yeah. that you're using? You know, and some, yeah, it, it's actually um, the biggest challenge is how can you fit the drilling equipment that you need into a tiny residential yard? And how can you keep the drilling site really neat and not... Uh -huh too messy because most yep. people, especially in suburban neighborhoods, do not want to create a huge mess in their yard. Right. So right. it's, um, those are sorts of problems that aren't typical in drilling. Like not many mm. drilling companies have had to miniaturize or make their process clean because it's just usually not a constraint that is right. faced. Yeah. So yeah. we've really had to invest in smaller equipment, more modular equipment so we can position it in whatever way fits in a given yard. And then really think about how do you contain the spoils? How do you generate less of a mess so right. that you're keeping the yard clean? Yeah. Well, that's going to definitely be, I've seen just the basic elements of, of someone trying to put a pool in their backyard. That can be a, a, yeah. a monstrous, you know, approach. Have you guys, have you talked to the boring company about maybe miniaturizing some of their tech? And cause I mean, obviously these guys are all about drilling. Mm -hmm. uh, anything, anything with going, uh, really advancing the technology itself? Um, we haven't talked to the boring company yet, but I do think that they are, it, it would be a fun conversation because they also <laughs> are taking like these technologies that have actually existed for a long time, but just exactly. re-examining, re like what are the opportunities yep. to make this less expensive? Because you know, there's a lot of problems in this world that would be easier to solve if it was cheaper to put things underground. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's talk a little bit about uh, long-term energy savings. Where does this really kind of, I mean, when you look at solar and the big proposition there and how it's, you know, potentially a, a great energy source, and usually you look at anywhere between eight and as many as 15 years on a return to get to a positive, uh, you know, cost savings for solar. Where does geothermal uh, lie up in that in that analysis? It's actually similar to solar. So we're uh, most of our customers are between a five and 10 year payback. And um, one thing that I think is important to note is that geothermal and solar are very complementary. So um, geothermal systems for the home are not producing electricity, they're pr producing heat or cooling. Right. So, you know, typically you would use your solar panels, for example, to run maybe your air conditioner. Mm -hmm. With a geothermal system, you would use your solar panels to run your whole geothermal system, and that system yeah. would do heating and cooling. So, um, mm -hmm. a lot of our customers opt for both, uh, which, you know, tends to work really well. And then they're using 100% renewable energy in the home, often at a lower price than they were paying before. From a standpoint of, um, all right, so that would be the ultimate off the grid, you know, home, I think, when you could combine geothermal and solar. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at kind of the legislative uh, hoops that we have to jump through on solar and what we're seeing in a lot of uh, the current uh, government and state administrations, there there seems to be always these little roadblocks that are thrown out there for a lot of these innovations. Are you guys facing the same kind of situation? I would I would say that actually for geo the the um, policy landscape has never looked better. So I think oh, good. Um, as time goes on. There's just greater recognition that we don't want to expand the natural gas network. Uh, mm -hmm. I think people are realizing we're likely not going to be using a lot of natural gas in 50 years, and you need to be confident that you will be in order to justify the cost of expanding right. that infrastructure. So there's mm -hmm. a lot more pressure to find non-fossil solutions for heat, and that's translated into state level and even I think some federal level policies that will be helpful. We do, fit, we do um, like solar, benefit from the investment tax credit. So this is a tax credit at the federal level that allows homeowners to get a tax rebate for 26% of the cost of their geothermal system, the same rebate they would get for solar. And right. that makes these systems much more affordable. So that's scheduled to go away over the next few years. And we're hoping that it doesn't, because I think um, extending that would have a dramatic impact on accelerating the adoption of these systems. 
Yeah, well, we, yes, and you know, we can. There's, you know, I know here recently we've seen, um, you know, just scenarios on electric vehicles where we've seen additional taxes come into play. I'm just kind of, you know, I'm concerned when you look at the legislative landscape that there, as you know, there's a lot of uh, incumbent players here that have been around for decades. It's a, you know, it's a very slow moving industry. And one that has a tremendous lobbying effort uh, yeah. to slow these kinds of technologies down. So I'm just I'm, yeah. I'm glad that you're not <laughs> right. running into that so much. I almost think like we're still so small to be under the radar, you know, like yeah. <laughs> if we're if we continue to be successful. And I think in a few years we'll be seeing that, too. I think um, at this point we're still kind of under the radar for a lot of those yeah. incumbents. Well, wait till you're the Tesla of uh, geothermal. You know, and then, you know, the bullseye is definitely yeah. going to be there for sure. Okay, so you guys have raised, yeah, exactly, what a great opportunity. You guys have raised $65 million. Um, so far. You've got some investment in from Bill Gates. Um, talk to me about that, because to me, I, I look at that and I think that doesn't sound like a lot of money for the mission that you're on. Is this just kind of the initial seed funding to kind of get your, uh, you know, engineering team going? What What is the the goal here to really ramp up and, and kind of go to market with some bigger plans? Um, yeah, I would say that we are in a position now where we have product market fit. We're selling a lot of these systems. Um, we can do so with it, the business model is working. You know, we have a good market for these. We have a product. It's we're now just like facing the problem of, okay, we're in a limited area today, New York, mm -hmm. Connecticut, right? but we want to expand that fairly rapidly and make these systems available much more broadly, you know, eventually nas nationally and then internationally. And so a yeah. lot of this recent round is, is going to be put towards that purpose. In addition to the geographical expansion, we have a lot more we want to do to advance heat pump technology and just make heat pumps increasingly effective and yeah. cost effective. Um, and so I'm really excited that we have this round of funding to really fund that R&D work because I think that could be breakthrough for us as well. What is holding you back from a regional aspect? Is it just your your own, you, you kind of are self-containing or is there something yeah. else that, okay, so it's just really kind of just, hey, let's take ourselves. small bites. Yeah, <laughs> small yeah. bites of this massive market. Um, like where do you see this, this going? Oh, where do I where see this see, where, Yeah, where do you see this going? I think that soon, I mean, maybe it will be a decade, maybe it will be two decades. Hopefully it will be even shorter. We'll we'll look back and think it was crazy that we just combusted a fossil fuel literally inside the houses that we live and breathe the air in every day. Yeah. You know, like it wasn't so long ago that people heated their homes with coal. And I think yeah. to a lot of us that sounds crazy, but some home some homeowners still do heat their homes with coal. Um, we encounter them all the time. Uh, it, it feels very anachronistic, and I think soon fuel oil, propane, and natural gas will feel exactly the same way. So right. I think there will be this shift in mindset where people, you know, sort of demand to not be combusting uh, poisonous fuel in their houses and heat pumps will just become the norm. Um, yeah. And everyone will know somebody who has one just sort of like solar is today. You know, we all sort of are very familiar with that technology. Is there any technology that is emerging? I've run, I've read some science uh, papers on a variety of different heat pump technologies that are coming out of uh, Europe that are really, one, they're super efficient, uh, but there actually are also some other benefits of these becoming potentially used in something like a geothermal or other types of use case uh, scenarios. What kind of tech are you seeing where if, if heat bumps were advanced really to a super efficient model, but what else could they do to potentially help this industry? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that um, really drives how the whole electric system is built today is these seasonal peaks, peak loads on the grid. So right. everyone mm -hmm. turns their air conditioner on at the same time on the hot days. And we really build our electrical infrastructure specifically to handle that. So yep. I think like as we transition to more efficient heat pumps, uh, some of the impact will be we just don't need to handle as pe as many peak loads. Yeah. Like it will, there will be a load balancing 
um, benefit that comes out of that. Interesting. And people are just starting to think about that now because it just hasn't, there haven't been enough heat pumps really to, to explore what you could do with that. But I think there's, there's going to be a lot of opportunities to coordinate how these systems are working to make the grid overall work much better. That's interesting because they're, you know, obviously with uh, what happened here recently in Texas, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in their, you know, Antarctic blast that could have pretty much shut down cities for days. That would have been a very beneficial advantage because a load on that grid system to heat those homes, obviously even, I know Elon Musk is in now a very active mode to try to figure out, you know, how to, to potentially re not repair the grid, but give it some assistance with your uh, potential technology, if you could ramp up heat pump productivity and uh, potentials inside mm -hmm. this where you could roll it out much faster. Do you guys have any kind of software development going on in your organization that could kind of help translate where that could potentially save, you know, these grids, uh, potentially billions of dollars, especially mm -hmm. in the build out? Anything going on there? We do, yeah. So one of the things we've done with all of the heat pumps that we've manufactured is um, they all have monitoring and controls built in, and they come standard with the unit. So, you know, we're we're really approaching this knowing that data and controls and coordination is going to be important in the future, and right. so we, it's important to us that this infrastructure, be, you know, it comes with that even yeah. in these early days when the algorithms that you would use and sort of like the way you might do this hasn't been fully figured out. Um, yeah. So it's something that we think about. Very cool. I, I uh, have had a chance to talk to some of the guys over at Tez Lab, which they do an analysis on uh, the kilowatt usage uh, for uh, you know the Tesla automobile. And uh, I w I'm impressed with their software development and kind of how they're going on, you know, how to improve uh, your kilowatt pro proficiency um, in terms of usage. But I could see that being kind of the case with something like what you guys are doing in the area of heat pumps. That would be a pretty amazing uh, software development. So kind of cool where you could have your own app all tied into, a, you know, a bigger grid that's all giving you that kind of feedback. That That's really cool. Exactly. Yeah. You you can see how your efficiency is changing over time. And then as utilities have things like time of use pricing, for example, yeah. um, homeowners might be excited to be able to set their own schedule so that their heat oh, pump huge. is most efficient when electricity is most expensive and then they can actually do most of their heating when electricity is very inexpensive. This just seems like such an exciting time right now for energy because there is there does seem to be the baton handing off, you know, to a lot of new innovations across whether it's solar, electric, you know, what we're seeing with uh, power walls from where many companies, not just Tesla, but also, you know, with, uh, you know, technologies like what you guys are doing. So, and obviously wind is, is another a big one as well. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting. Let's talk about one last item and that is kind of how do you reduce the cost? Cause you're at around $25,000 for an installation. A lot of homeowners might look at that as a little bit pricey. Um, yeah. Maybe not though. Wh where is the tar Where do you feel like the sweet spot is for this to be able to take on mass adoption? Mm -hmm. Well, I will say that at our current price point in New York, where our primary market is, a mm -hmm. homeowner using fuel oil or propane comes out ahead. So when they finance the system, uh, they don't have to pay anything up front and their monthly payment is lower than what they were paying before. So wow. it's it works there. That said, like you're absolutely right. It's going to be our mission forever as a company to bring down the cost. And I still see so many opportunities for doing that. I mean, everything from, you know, we're, we always are investing and in finding ways of putting those ground loops in that are less expensive. And that's something right. we're continuing to be very focused on. We're investing a lot in heat pump R&D to bring the cost of those systems down, even the cost of financing for the homeowner. So if a homeowner wants to finance the system, making the cost of that financing much lower, I think that's something that we might be able to do in fairly near term that will have a big impact on cost. So we're still early enough that there are just a lot of opportunities. And I would imagine the cost of these systems will come down fairly quickly over time. Are you guys applying any of this technology to potential commercial building or ap other applications in use cases? Not yet. Today we're completely focused on residential. Focused on residential. 
Interesting, yeah. cool stuff. I like it. Has any of the big um, fossil fuel companies come to you, you know, natural gas companies come to you and, and potentially said, hey, let's, let's do something here to potentially assist you? I would say we've had a few very early conversations. Some of these big fossil fuel companies have um, clean tech sort of incubators or right. you know yep. just initiatives within them. And so we have had a few of those conversations. There's um, an interesting company, a big company in Canada who reached out to us recently. It's an interesting story, so that's why I bring it up. They, they are a fuel oil company. They, they, for it's like a very large family company and for generations they've been supplying a large number of homeowners in Canada with fuel oil and furnaces. The, the generation, the youngest generation in that company that's going to inherit the business sees the writing on the wall and so they're transitioning ah, the company to an electric cool. conversion company. So they've reached out because they're very interested in becoming a heat pump company, you know? And so I think that type of story, I just see a lot of uh, meaning in it, you know? It's like yeah, a lot of yeah. these um, businesses that are smaller perhaps than like the ones that we think about as the big multinationals, they, they, there really are real efforts to, to change and to adapt and to make sure that their businesses can survive the transition that's coming. And that's really nice to see. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's just, you know, survival of the fittest when you look at those smaller companies. You know, it's the it's usually family owned or at least, you know, somewhat privately held in the sense of so they understand kind of, you know, you have to innovate or die. And yes. versus when you get into some of these bigger companies, they're dealing usually with shareholders, market prices, a lot of, you know, distributors and it's a different game because you're serving so many ma masters. Exactly. You can't just admit like, okay, we should probably transit. It's harder. It's like more yeah. um, difficult to be so plain spoken about what's going on. But I think with some of these large companies that are private, as you said, you just see it. They're, they're ready. They're ready to make yeah. the switch. Very cool stuff. Listen, Kathy, it's been great having you on. Thank you so much. We're definitely going to keep, uh, keep an eye on where you guys are going in terms of your progress. And if anything comes up, Make sure and shoot us a note because we'd love to uh, get you guys back on as as things evolve for you and you develop new new tech in this area. But thanks for stopping in. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. All right. So all of you listening in over on the podcast, whether it's on iTunes, Spotify, maybe even Amazon, Amazon Music, make sure and leave us a rating. That's how we get great feedback from you. And of course, how we understand what you want to hear and see here on TechPath. And if you are uh, over on YouTube, make sure and hit the like and also uh, the bell so you can get uh, notifications of any kind of new content that we're producing here on TechPath and from Reverend Networks. If you have an idea for a show, make sure and shoot us a email. You can do it the old fashioned way. And that is producer at reverendnetworks.com or you can hit me up on Twitter at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.